Hello and welcome to Void Electronics. In today's video I would like to talk about one of the most important and misunderstood parameters of any oscilloscope, the bandwidth. To clarify this topic, as always, we will combine a bit of theory and some practice so that you will get a feel of what the oscilloscope does when you take it out of its bandwidth comfort zone. We have two scopes here with identical settings looking at the same signal produced by this signal generator. This is a 3 MHz sine wave at 20 volts peak to peak. On the right scope the signal spans 4 divisions peak to peak, which is correct. However, on the left one the signal spans just a little bit over 1 division. Now let's change the waveform to a square wave. Weirdly enough, we get a square wave on the right oscilloscope and a sine wave on the left scope. So who's right here? To understand this, we have to understand the bandwidth limit of an oscilloscope. The bandwidth is so important that it's usually written right on the front panel of the instrument. But what is it though? Is it the maximum frequency that the scope can probe into? Well, not really. And if you don't understand what it is, the scope can easily fool you in certain circumstances. So let's dig deeper. Think about this for a while. Let's say you have a 100 MHz scope and you want to probe a 200 MHz signal. What do you think would happen? Will the scope blow up? Will the scope display an error message saying that the bandwidth is too low? Hmm, probably not. Let's look at bandwidth from an analog perspective and then we'll see how it applies to digital scopes. Back in the day of analog scopes, you can imagine that the circuitry inside acted like a low-pass filter. That's not due to an evil engineer who added a low-pass filter on purpose just to mess with us, of course, but rather it's an inherent limitation of the internal circuitry that could only run so fast before the gain rolled off due to parasitics, the Miller effect and other limitations as such. So to characterize this inherent roll-off, we think of it as a low-pass filter and simply look at the minus 3 dB point. The minus 3 dB point is simply the frequency for which the amplitude drops by 3 dB with respect to the low frequency gain. This is what the bandwidth is. Simple, right? This is easily doable in a simulator, but what about testing the actual scope? Do we need to take it apart and probe into it using expensive test equipment in order to find the bandwidth? Well, of course not. We only need to connect it to a signal generator and find the frequency for which the amplitude drops by 3 dB. So to do this experiment, we have to start with a low frequency that is well within the bandwidth of the oscilloscope. 10 kHz would do. The signal has to be a sine wave, of course, so I reconfigure the generator to produce a sine wave. And now we have to adjust this signal so that it spans vertically in an integer amount of divisions. For example, 6 divisions would do. Something like this. Now we need to convert 3 dB into a linear gain, which is around 0.707. And we need to multiply this number by our number of divisions in order to find the 3 dB point. So the signal drops from 6 divisions down to around 4.2 divisions, and this would be our minus 3 dB point. So let's increase the frequency until we get to that level. So how about 50 kHz? Ok, this is still flat, 100 kHz, I would say it's still flat, 200 kHz, ok, 500, 700 kHz, 800, how about 1 MHz, it's still doing ok, let's go to 1.2 MHz. I think we can increase it just a little bit more, 1.3 MHz. And right here we have around 4.2 divisions, which is our 3 dB point. So this means that the bandwidth of this oscilloscope is around 1.3 MHz. This exceeds the specifications, by the way, because the specifications claim a bandwidth of 1 MHz. So this is really nice. Now let's see if we can use the oscilloscope past the bandwidth. So. Let's increase the frequency even more and see if we can get any sort of detail. But before doing that, let's crank the time base all the way up. So, as you can see, by adjusting it and maybe the trigger as well, we get a sine wave here, so we can see what's going on. And also, we can adjust the horizontal vernier, and this way we will get some 
magnification on the horizontal axis. This is like a time stand magnification or something like that. And as you can see, we still get a sine wave even though it's very faint. Let's keep going. How about 2 MHz? Okay, it still looks like a sine wave, 3 MHz. We can still see it. How about 4 MHz? Now the trigger doesn't trigger anymore, but we can adjust it maybe. How about 5 MHz? We still have something here. Maybe we can increase the sensitivity and it doesn't trigger anymore. Anyway, we still get a sine wave at around 5 MHz, which is five times the bandwidth of the oscilloscope. So as you can see, you can use the scope beyond its bandwidth. However, the amplitude will not be accurate at all. But what about other waveforms? Well, this is where things get even trickier. As you may know, the famous mathematician Fourier revolutionized mathematics by showing that any periodic function can be obtained by summing up sine waves of different frequencies, amplitudes and phases. These spectral components are called harmonics. This works both ways, so you can break down an arbitrary waveform into sine waves, or you can use a bunch of sine waves to synthesize an arbitrary waveform. Let's see what this has to do with today's topic. Well, a sine wave only has one spectral component, as you can see right here. So, when observed on the oscilloscope, its amplitude simply rolls off as we increase the frequency. But when feeding different waveforms into an oscilloscope, let's say a square wave, the square wave contains lots of odd harmonics, meaning that a 10 kHz square wave, for example, will have a spectral component on 10 kHz, which is the fundamental, but it will also have a spectral component at 30 kHz, which is the third harmonic, at 50 kHz, which is the fifth harmonic, and so on. We can easily observe it on the oscilloscope once again. As you can see on the FFT, we have lots of harmonics now. When we combine all these harmonics with the low pass characteristic of a scope, what happens is that the higher order harmonics get more attenuation than the lower order ones. The faster the edge is, the higher the bandwidth, meaning that fast signals tend to be rounded out into sine waves. That's because in an extreme scenario, the low pass characteristic can only pass the fundamental, and since we lose the higher order harmonics, we get a plain sine wave. Now, there's a third way in which bandwidth affects the way we observe signals on the oscilloscope, and that is the rise time. The rise time is the time it takes a signal to go from 10% to 90% of its peak. This also has to do with Fourier analysis, because the lower the rise time, the higher the bandwidth. For example, a square wave with instantaneous edges would have infinite bandwidth. Such a signal is impossible to produce, of course, but even if it were to exist, it would only appear as fast as the internal circuitry of the oscilloscope is. That's why the rise time is an important parameter of an oscilloscope. Since bandwidth and rise time are related, let's look at the actual formula. As you already know, the bandwidth is a frequency and the rise time is obviously, well, time. So we know that time is the inverse of frequency. However, the rise time is not really the inverse of bandwidth. It is indeed proportional to the inverse of the rise time, but it also has a coefficient to it that comes from some Fourier analysis and the impulse response of a first order system. So the formula says that rise time is approximately 0.35 divided by the bandwidth. To observe this in practice, we need a square wave signal with really fast edges or a really fast pulse. One way to get such a fast pulse is to use this really nice pulser designed by the great Jim Williams in one of his application notes. This was modified by my friend Alex from the Gears and Gear YouTube channel. This is a high voltage power supply that biases a bipolar transistor into a region that everybody told us to avoid, which is the avalanche region. Since the transistor has a small capacitor in its collector, this forms a relaxation oscillator. The capacitor charges, the transistor goes into avalanche mode, it discharges into a 50 ohm terminator, creating a fast pulse, and the cycle continues. The interesting thing here is that the avalanche is really fast, so you can get pulses with a rise time as low as a few hundred picoseconds. So it's so fast, we can assume it's instantaneous for low bandwidth oscilloscopes. Now let's plug it into a few of my scopes and see what we get. This is a Siglent. 1204 and it's a 200 megahertz scope so let's see what we get here 
we have a rise time of about 1 nanosecond and by doing the math this gives us a bandwidth of around 350 megahertz. So taking into account the fact this is a 200 megahertz scope I would say this is ok. So in theory this exceeds the specifications. Moving on to the Tektronix 213. This is really fuzzy because this is taking it right to the edge but uh, we are at around 200 nanoseconds per division. The rise time is around 1 division so 200 nanoseconds which gives us a bandwidth of around 1.75 megahertz. So interestingly enough once again this exceeds the specifications of the scope and this is close enough to the minus 3db method that I've shown you earlier. On the Tektronix 466 we get a rise time of around 2.5 nanoseconds which gives us a bandwidth of around 140 megahertz. This is great once again taking into account the fact that this is a 100 megahertz scope. So once again this being a Tektronix it exceeds the specifications. Believe it or not even this vacuum tube scope can trigger onto the pulse. This is a Tektronix 515A. It's supposed to have a 15 megahertz bandwidth and it gives us a rise time of around 20 nanoseconds which is great. This gives us an equivalent bandwidth of around 17.5 MHz, so once again it exceeds the specifications. This one even has a specified rise time right here on the front panel, so it is well within spec. It's supposed to be 23 nanoseconds. So to sum things up, the limited bandwidth of the oscilloscope affects the observed amplitude, the waveform and even the rise time of the signal. So if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and if you are interested in more content related to electronics and programming please subscribe to this channel because there is more content like this on the way. That's it for now. Bye.